If you got a uh, bulletin, there's a sermon outline in there, and I would invite you to pull that out. Give you an idea where we're going this morning. Today I get to preach one last sermon. Uh, preaching a sermon is something I've been doing every week of my life for uh, the past 30 years, at least once a week. <laughs> Uh, and it seems awkward, it seems sad, but the time has come to put a cap on uh, that part of my life story. I have preached some 3,442 sermons since becoming a pastor. Not that anyone's keeping track or anything. <laughs> uh, and I have preached through a lot of the Bible. But I realized uh, this week there are parts of the Bible that I have not uh, covered ever. And uh, one of them um, is a passage in the New Testament uh, that tells the story of Eutychus. I never preached through the story of Eutychus, and that's not just because he's got a funny sounding name. Um, near the end of Paul's third missionary journey, Paul and his team stopped for a week in Troas. Uh, the last night of his visit was a Sunday night, and the church gathered for service to hear Paul preach. And so Paul did what preachers do. He preached, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached, and he preached into the night. Uh, and uh, this young man by the name of Eutychus was sitting in an upstairs window. The text says this, Eutychus was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Now, for obvious reasons, that's a passage that most pastors don't uh, spend a lot of time uh, <laughs> preaching on. It may be a little bit too personally convicting. But uh, if you read that story, you read that chapter, uh, there is a very interesting outcome in Eutychus' case. Paul went down, raised the young man back to life. And you would think that would be a good indicator, hey, let's all go home, right? Let's all go home, be happy. Uh, but Paul did not take the hint. Instead, it says he went back to preaching, and the text says he continued talking until daylight. So, on my one last sermon, I give you something to be thankful for. <laughs> I may be long-winded, but not Acts 20 long-winded. Um, and I start with that story, though, uh, partly because it leads into where I do want to look at with you. So if you would, uh, if you've got a Bible or the Bible up on your phone there, find Acts chapter 20 with me, because I want to look at the second part of that chapter uh, with you for my final sermon as your pastor. Now, as I mentioned earlier, Paul was nearing the end of his third missionary journey. The trip started in Acts chapter 18 and verse 23. Uh, it had included a three-year stay in the city of Ephesus. And every, eventually things uh, there in Ephesus went from bad to, uh, to worse. And uh, the team had to leave and moved on to other cities in Macedonia. Uh, throughout that entire trip of the third missionary journey, Acts 18 forward, Paul had a secondary mission. He'd been raising funds for the Christian church back in Jerusalem. Sort of the mother church had gone through hard times. There'd been persecution, there'd been famine. And uh, Paul felt it uh, would be uh, go a long way in building goodwill for the Gentile churches of Asia and Europe to collect an offering and to uh, assist the largely Jewish church located back in Jerusalem. So he'd been doing that through this whole trip. He'd been collecting cash and, and uh, banking that and knew that he needed to deliver those funds. But doing so put him really at a crossroads in his life and a crossroads in his ministry. Um, moments of life change are sometimes exciting and often very unnerving. You've probably experienced that. Paul was at that kind of a place after what happened there in Troas with Eutychus. He was heading to the shore, going to board a ship, head towards Jerusalem, and then the process would pass within 30 miles of Ephesus. And so Paul decided that he would send for some friends. He would ask for the pastors of that city, the church in Ephesus, to come over to the coast, over to the port city of Miletus, so he could say goodbye. And that's what I want to look at with you. Uh, the book of Acts contains eight sermons that Paul preached. They're all recorded by Luke. Uh, 
And it's rather interesting to me, seven of them were directed towards unbelievers. Some of them, some of those really towards opponents. And so seven of those sermons uh, are attempts by Paul to convince those that aren't believers yet to listen and to respond and understand the gospel. There's only one sermon that's different, and that's this one. It's the only sermon that Paul preached that's recorded in Acts that was directed towards Christians, and it carries the tone of Pastor Paul saying goodbye. And I want to start verse 17 with you. So if you've got a Bible, you can follow along with me. It says in verse 17, From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, and in the midst of severe testing by the plots of my Jewish opponents. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but have taught you publicly and from house to house. I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. Now, Miletus was a port city in the time of the Bible. You'd never know it today. Uh, it is now a swamp area. That is the, a picture of the, um, the stadium uh, that is in, in Miletus today. It's in southwest Asia. And the area that used to be the coastline um, is now filled with silt, and you couldn't get a ship through there if you wanted to. Uh, eight years ago, I had the opportunity to sit in Miletus, and uh, imagine Paul calling his friends, telling them of his love, rehearsing the past three years that they had spent together in the city of Ephesus, and saying goodbye. And the things that, the things that he shared with them are things that I kind of echo and, and I want to share with you this morning. And so if you've got the, the hand out there, you can... Write some of this down. Um, the first one is this. Like Paul, I hope that you will remember with fondness the past ministry moments. Um, especially those that were stretching. The verses that I read there, verses 17 down through 21, they're all past tense. Um, Paul's life was changing. And as he looked back on the previous season of ministry with these friends, there's this wave of emotions and a wave of memories that swept over. And I get that feeling. Uh, they had been through an awful lot together. In the process, they had seen Paul's life up close. They knew his character. And I, I read the words there, you know, of Paul's personal testimony. You guys know me. You've seen me. We've been through an awful lot. And especially this inner circle, you know, this crew of elders from the church at Ephesus, they had lived up close with Paul. They knew his humility. They knew the many nights that he cried himself to sleep over people and over problems and, and then would stand boldly in the face of plots and opposition. They watched that. They'd been there by his side. Um, he had not, as he wrote, he had not hesitated to preach, to spend time individually with them, house to house, was his description, to share the gospel in a way that drew people to Jesus. And I've got to think, you know, as I read that through and think about Paul's personal experience with these people in the city of Ephesus for three years, especially these close friends in the church there, I have to think that a face or two went across the screen, you know, when he wrote some of those phrases. Um... Situations resurfaced in his memory. Moments of ministry flooded back in. They'd been through a lot in three years. And he wanted them to remember those times with fondness, especially the times that had been stretching, you know, as he talks about times that we faced opposition. And as I read that this past week, I realized, you know, Paul had three years in Ephesus to look back on. Uh, Shell and I have 20 years in the city of Everett and this church family to look back on. Um, packing up my office this past week, I came across four VCR tapes that Dave Arndt made. And kids, you can go home and ask your parents what a VCR tape is. They'll explain it to you. Um, but Dave documented the building project on those four tapes, and I left them on the shelf down there. Um, 
which uh, it was, let's be honest, it was a ridiculous undertaking that we tackled within the very first year that I was here as your pastor. I have images seared into my memory, some of them not in a good way, <laughs> from those first couple years. You know, tearing the roof off the family room, Steve Campbell in that backhoe of his, um, digging down between the horseshoe that was the building here before uh, so that we could build more building in between. Walking out that foyer door on a Sunday morning in July and looking straight up into the blue sky. Uh, even standing at the urinal in the bathroom and being able to do the same thing. <laughs> that was the summer of 2004. Um, a crane setting new rafters and being up there with guys like Tori and Gary nailing those things down. Um, at heights that I would much rather avoid. That's crazy stuff. Stretching times. Uh, but times that showed the fingerprints of God. We saw prayer after prayer after prayer answered and that entire overall finished and paid for. The barn a dime. Uh, this building isn't the same as it was in March of 2003. But neither are the people. I have changed, many of you have changed, and I hope for the better. We've watched people come to Christ, um, observed them grow as disciples, as Pastor Curtis mentioned earlier, some went on one or more of three trips to Brazil. Others served in vacation Bible school, reaching generation after generation with the gospel of Jesus every summer. The past 20 years just packed full of ministry moments that will always echo in my heart. And I hope they will in yours too. But I also hope that you don't live in the past ministry moments. Paul didn't. Paul didn't. He did not want his ministry colleagues from Ephesus to just sort of dwell too long on the past. He moved quickly to the present and the future and so for the rest of this chapter and for the rest of this message, I want to do the same. I want to challenge you from Paul's words with four more important takeaways that the rest of this chapter talks about. And the next is this challenge that moving forward, moving forward, follow the Holy Spirit's leading in your life and in our church. You go to verse 22 and he shifts from the past to the right now and now... Compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Now that last verse, if you were here last Sunday, it may sound very familiar. Uh, that last verse really echoes what we read in 2 Timothy 4 last weekend. Though it was written years earlier uh, by Paul. Paul viewed all of his life as this race to be run. And he would finish the race well. But it was his focus all the way through. His aim was to finish well, to accomplish the task of telling others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, but at the moment, right then, as he was telling them this, life was very, very uncertain. He could not possibly know the future, but Paul was venturing into the unknown. He and his team were heading to Jerusalem to deliver that gift of funds, fully aware that Jerusalem was the hotbed of Jewish hatred towards him and his ministry of reaching Gentiles. He had no way of knowing what was in the next season of his life. Now, we get to know that because we have the rest of the book of Acts and we have the advantage of seeing back in hindsight. Um, upon arriving in Jerusalem, it took just over a week. That's it. One week. Uh, before things got very ugly. Paul was arrested. He was falsely accused. Uh, he was locked up to wait for a government-sponsored boat ride to the capital city of Rome and a hearing before Caesar. And he would remain in prison for the next five years. 
uh, I, you got to think, you know, if he had known all of that, he might have had second thoughts about moving forward. Um, but notice twice in there, twice in there he says that he was uh, uh, compelled by the Holy Spirit. Um, he stressed to his friends it was God's direction that was happening in his life. Both compelled and warned by the Holy Spirit. But he trusted that. He trusted God's guidance. I came across a rather interesting picture this past week. You've probably seen it before, but it was described in the caption as the most terrifying space photograph ever. That picture was taken in 1984, and that is astronaut Bruce McCandless II, who was the very first astronaut to do a spacewalk without any tether, without any connection at all to the ship, just counting on what his equipment could do to get him back to his spacecraft. He floated completely disconnected from anything that would give him the feeling of safety for six hours and 17 minutes. And I saw that picture and I thought, you know, sometimes life feels like that, doesn't it? Uh, terrifying, no sense of safety, sort of floating into the complete unknown. Life can feel that way for any of us in, in transition times and challenging times. We can all have that same feeling. And yet, for Christ followers, for people committed to follow Jesus Christ, we can be conscious of a very different reality. Despite how it feels, we are never disconnected. We are never floating off into oblivion. We are never recklessly unattached from safety. If you're a child of God through faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is with you and, in fact, is in you. And like I mentioned last Sunday, Jesus stands beside you. You're never alone. Well, he sang it before. Never once do you ever walk alone if you're a child of God. Knowing that, being willing to follow the Holy Spirit, are key strategies just to navigate life and key for us as a church. Follow the Holy Spirit. Not your intuition, not your personal vibes. Follow the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit's leading your life and in our church's future. Just like Paul um, and the church in Ephesus had been given this task uh, to testify to the good news of the, God's grace in their world, in their community, this church has the same task. Uh, follow the Holy Spirit as you move toward that aim. Pray often. Talk to God often. Ask for the direction to know His will for your day every single day and for our church every single week. And he'll provide that. I think it is rather intriguing that Paul was given a heads up by God that it was going to get ugly. Uh, and at the very same time, he compelled him to move forward. Uh, the Holy Spirit compelled me to go to Jerusalem, but also the Holy Spirit warns me that when I get there, things are not going to be fun. God's directions in our lives are not always safe, but they are always best. Be sure. Be sure that you talk to Him, listen to Him, but then follow Him. Now go back to where we stopped in verse 25. Uh, you find this. It says, Now I know that none of, you, uh, none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Now, I don't know how true this is, but sometimes pastors get accused of being a little bit overdramatic. Um, I think Paul might have been slightly guilty of that uh, in ventured into that territory with his opening line because you get to the end of the chapter and uh, what grieved these guys, this crew the most, was his little throwaway line there that they would never see him again. You know, Paul had no way of knowing that was true. <laughs> Paul had no way of knowing the future. 
uh, that for certain. But because he said it, they kind of focused on that line and they missed his bigger point. And his bigger point was that as a pastor and their pastor, he had determined over three years of steady preaching ministry uh, to clearly share about the kingdom of God. And I love the phrase that he used, to proclaim the whole will of God. Sometimes that translated the whole counsel of God. Paul had intentionally intentionally avoided hobby horses and saying the things they wanted to hear or saying the things he wanted to say. Uh, he was completely committed to proclaim the entire body of Scripture, what God wants to say. Um, over the years of my ministry, I have been committed to what is sometimes called expository preaching. At, uh, the simple definition is exposing or unpacking what's in a specific text. And that's why we go to places like Acts 20 and we stay there. As, uh, uh, that's just the way that I've approached preaching. A lot of preaching today amounts to the presentation of the polished ideas of the preacher with verses attached that hopefully support the points being made. Um, but my concern with that is simply that uh, that's not how God gave us the Bible. He gave us the Bible in letters and history books and narratives and poetry that were compiled and written as a unified whole and to do justice to God's Word and not my ideas, studying through the entire letter of 2 Timothy like we did the past month, uh, the entire Gospel of Luke like we did the past year and a half, major sections of Genesis or, or whatnot. Seem like the wisest way to proclaim what Paul said there, the whole will of God. Some side benefits. Um, I always knew what we were going to talk about the next Sunday because it's the next passage, right? It's the very next paragraph. But also a side benefit, I think, and I hope, is that it helped you see that's the best way to study the Bible, just to read through it in its context, in the way God wrote it. And study the Bible for yourself that way. You don't need a crib sheet of Bible verses um, on every topic. God didn't write the Bible with some index in the back that tags all the relevant topics for 2023. You know, go to this verse and you'll be fine. He wrote it as a book to be read in its entirety. Uh, in context, with an overall message that cannot be distilled down to just sort of grabbing one verse here and one verse there. Read the Bible through and you'll find the help you need. It's always been amazing to me uh, how often God brings me to a passage, you know, as I read through the Bible every year on a schedule, how he brings me to a passage on some random day that is exactly what I needed on that particular day. Couldn't have uh, scripted it and I didn't go looking for it. God's word has that kind of power. Now, I hesitated putting this point in because I'm not interested in carrying any influence over the choice for my successor as senior pastor, but I do have some advice, right? Everybody's got advice and everybody's got opinions. Uh, among what other, tr whatever other traits you are, um, you think, as individuals and as a church, are a priority for a pastor, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 are the two biblical passages where God says what he thinks. And if you look at those two places, you find there are two critical qualifications to be a pastor. Godly character and the ability to teach God's word effectively. I want to challenge you to make sure those are the top two things on the list for you as individuals and you as a church family. Godly character and the ability to teach God's word effectively. I just put this number three, seek a pastor who will proclaim the whole will of God. It is rather interesting that Paul is addressing the elders of the church in Ephesus. You find that back in verse 17. In verse 28, he refers to the exact same men as overseers and shepherds. The word overseer is the Greek word episkopos, where the Episcopalian church gets their name from, uh, and is sometimes translated bishop. The third word, shepherd, that's where we get pastor from. That's what that translates into. Uh, the three titles of elder, bishop, and pastor are all used 
the same group of men in this chapter. There's one other place, 1 Peter 5, where that is also the case. All three words used of the exact same men. And so Paul is addressing the, the spiritual leaders, the pastors there in the church at Ephesus. But his words really trickle down to everybody. And we stop to verse 27, go back to verse 28. He continues his train of thought. He said, Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds, be pastors of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. For I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. It certainly is the role of pastors, very graphically portrayed with the word shepherds, to guard against the attack of wolves. But that's a, a wise practice for more than just spiritual leaders. That's something all of us I need to take seriously. All of us need to be alert to the spiritual dangers in our own hearts as well as those that will affect the lives of those people that we care about. And you notice he starts with that. He says, keep watch over yourselves. Keep watch over your own heart. Um, if you do not prioritize your personal spiritual growth, your commitment to God's Word, your determination to pray, your dedication to being a disciple who worships, links, learns, and serves, if you don't prioritize that, you cannot and will not be able to help anybody else. Watch over yourselves first. But then, he moves right into and keep watch over other people. Look out for each other. Look out for each other spiritually. Jesus gave his very blood for the church of God. He loves us that much, which also means Satan hates us that much. The uh, takeaway, I worded this way, guard against false doctrine and fragmented unity because Satan wants to see both of those. He does. And he'll work towards both of those. Paul was quite convinced that savage wolves would come in to devour members of the church now that he was gone. And you know, we're 2,000 years later than that. We're 2,000 years removed from there. But the enemy is still alive and well. And uh, he may not make his attacks as obvious as we might think when we read through some of the Gospels, but he is actively derailing so much in our world. He is. When... Uh, my grandmother was still alive. She lived to be 98. But she had a routine every night of watching the Wheel of Fortune in Jeopardy. And we could come in town with the kids and whatnot, you know, visiting for a couple weeks and whatnot, and go over to visit. Didn't matter. If you visited between 7 and 8, you're going to be watching the Wheel of Fortune in Jeopardy, <laughs> even if she hadn't seen you for months, because that, that was what she did every night. Um, I thought of her when I read this a couple weeks ago. There was a question posed on Jeopardy that was literally worth $53,999, almost fifty-four grand, was on the line with this one question. And this was the question. Matthew 6, 9 says, Our Father which art in heaven, blank be thy name. This be thy name. How many of you know what goes in the blank? What is it? Hallowed, Hallowed be thy name. Uh, you probably have seen this already too, but not a single one of those three contestants knew the word that dropped in the bank. Nobody knew the word hallowed. My grandmother would have been shocked. She'd be yelling at the television, how could they not know the Lord's Prayer? Um, and you know what? It tells you something. Uh, it, true, it's anecdotal. That three very smart people don't know the words of the Lord's Prayer doesn't prove anything really. But it is a, that's where we are in America today kind of moment. That's where we are. Uh, the anchor of God's truth has been so marginalized among so many in our society uh, that uh, there is little awareness of the content, much less the truth of God's book. That's concerning. 
And being that we live in this area, in this era, and we're raising kids in this era, and we are influencing grandchildren in the season of world perspective, we have to do something different. We have to really take this seriously and guard against the inroads in our kids, in our church, in our own hearts with anything but the truth. Paul wrote in there that um, attacks will come from the outside, but they'd also come from the inside. He said, from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples after them. This interesting line at the end, draw disciples after them. Uh, Any person other than Jesus that wants you to follow them, no matter what, uh, should be viewed with some suspicion. Paul's heart was as a pastor. He loved them. He wanted the best for them. He wanted them to remain on guard. All the time be alert to false doctrine from the outside, fragmented unity from the inside. And then he signed off. He signed off this uh, goodbye sermon with his last paragraph, verse 32. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. When Paul had finished speaking, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. Um, What grieved them most was his statement that they would never see his face again. And they accompanied him to the, the ship. Paul gives a benediction of sorts there. Commits them to his grace, God's grace. Uh, Grace alone that can build them up and produce eternal reward. And I would pass along that same that same challenge. Always trust God's grace. Uh, lean into the promises He gives to provide just what you need, just when you need it. I commit you to God. I commit you to God's, God's grace. I find it rather intriguing that much of that paragraph, though, is a reminder of how He left this model of working hard so they could give generously. And I really think those last, those points kind of go together. Trust God's grace. Trust God's grace while you remain committed to give. If you try and track down the red print there, where it says the Lord Jesus himself said it's more blessed to give than to receive, you try and track that down in the Gospels, you won't find it. (laughs) It's one of those unique passages in Scripture. Uh, Either it was passed along verbally from the disciples and never written down, or Paul himself had heard Jesus say that to him. But because the Holy Spirit uh, was inspiring this piece of Scripture, just like the Gospels, we know that Jesus did say that. That Jesus is the one who connected the dots. That blessing is directly tied to generosity. And I'd remind you of that. Um, You can never go wrong by choosing abundant generosity. In times when economic challenges face all of us and when the church is sort of in a period of transition, I get it. It may be tempting to skimp a bit on faithful, consistent giving. I would challenge you to resist that. Resist that. Our church needs the financial stability of weekly, percentage-based, generous givers right now more than ever before. And the other side of it, you need what that will do in your life as well. You do. God brings blessing to those who are committed to give. Jesus himself promised it. So be a giver. Trust God's grace to provide. During the craziness of 2020, I, uh, I read a, a novel by Marilyn Robinson uh, entitled Gilead. Um, it won a Pulitzer Prize, but it seemed to be uh, 
to me, targeted toward a rather narrow audience. Got ahead of myself. See, the book is set in the 1950s uh, as a bit of a memoir of a small town pastor in the fictional town of Iowa of Gilead. The pastor's name was the Reverend John Ames. And uh, his father before him was the pastor of the church in that town and he wrote to his seven-year-old son of the blessings and the, frankly, challenges of his time as a pastor as well as what he'd learned as a pastor's kid. Now, I say it felt sort of targeted to a rather narrow audience because uh, people that would connect most with some of the memorable phrases and descriptions and situations that were written there would really only be those who have invested their lives week by week in the shepherding role of a small town church. For instance, he wrote this. Uh, my father always preached from notes, and I wrote my sermons out word for word. There are boxes of them in the attic. A few recent years of them in stacks in the closet. I have never gone back to them to see if they were worth anything. If I actually said anything. Pretty nearly my whole life's work is in those boxes. Which is an amazing thing to reflect on. Uh, today we live in the day of digitized everything, but when I began in ministry 30 years ago, I printed out every single sermon. And because I was poor, I didn't have the type of computer programs to be able to save it in a format that I would uh, perpetually still have them. And that means that when I moved here, uh, I brought along two filing cabinets that I'm leaving behind. <laughs> two filing cabinets that were full of, full of sermons. Over the past few months, I've worked through them all from those first 10 years of ministry, scanning most and just tossing some. They reflect a lot of time, invested in thinking how to speak God's Word with clarity and effectiveness. I've told several people over the past few weeks that one of the hardest things for me to navigate in this journey for me right now is counting down to the final sermon. I've had the same routine for 30 years. Studying, writing, praying every Saturday night for God to show up and do something the next morning. Same routine for 30 years. Which includes, sort of brings me to another quote. It's the one I put up there a minute ago. In the words of Reverend Ames, Sometimes I have loved the peacefulness of an ordinary Sunday. It is like standing in a newly planted garden after a warm rain. You can feel the silent and invisible life. All it needs from you is that you take care not to trample on it. I have felt that way. Many Sundays over three decades. Ordinary. Ordinary Sundays when God showed up and the seed of His Word settled deep in somebody's heart. It's really kind of mind blowing to be a part of that in a small way, even. I didn't do any of it perfectly most weeks, not even very well. But my goal has been not to trample on what God's been doing. Because God is the one who does it. Through His book, through His Spirit, and in His church. I realize that most of you have probably never seen this. But on the back of this pulpit, there is a piece of paper taped that was there long before I came. It's very faded. Um, but it has a quote on it from John chapter 12 and verse 21 that says, Sir, we... W it 
said, sir, we would see Jesus. That has always been my goal. Not that you would see me. Not that you would be impressed at all by this person. But that you would see Jesus through his word. The amazing thing about God's work in this world is that he uses people like us. And that it does not hinge on any one person beyond Jesus. I have a friend who uh, often says cemeteries are full of indispensable men. And God will bring a next pastor here to pick up the baton and continue the work and ever doing greater things than I ever could have dreamed. I'm confident of that. And I will pray towards that. And I want to challenge you. Support him. Pray for him. Listen to him. Follow his lead. Pick up the challenges of Acts chapter 20 along the way. And as you do, you will see week after week after week an ever-changing, newly planted garden of eternally transformed lives take spiritual root and blossom and grow and bear fruit for years to come. And as you do also, my greater prayer for you as a church and as individual friends is this. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's the Savior. He is the important one. He is the one to whom we are to grow to become like. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Hey, let's pray. Father God, I am so, so thankful for the opportunity to, this day, open your word. Uh, to think about the blessing of being a communicator of your word to people. And as I have shared in these past moments, Lord, my heart is that over all this time and the things that I've said and the things that you have led me through in the week to prepare for every single Sunday, that we're all a little bit closer to being like Jesus. Because your word is power, your Holy Spirit uses it as a sword to cut to the quick. And you grow us and you change us every single week. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for the blessing, being a part of it. And I pray that we would never stop, that we would never turn away, that we would continue to press forward in that journey, making disciples right here. And wherever you take us, making disciples for Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. In his name I pray. Amen.